Hello, my name is Ralph Ermoyan. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Radiation Oncology at the University of Washington in Seattle, Washington in the United States. I want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to give this talk on practical aspects of radiation therapy and neuroblastoma. First, I want to acknowledge uh, some conflicts of interest. Um, I am the section editor for pediatrics and sarcoma for the Red Journal, uh, for which I receive a stipend, and in theory, this could affect um, which studies I choose to show. I also want to acknowledge that my practice includes both photons and protons, um, and that could also affect some of my recommendations. First, some background on neuroblastoma. It is the second most common abdominal tumor in childhood and the most common abdominal tumor in children less than 18 months. It arises from neurocrest cells or sympathetic nervous system tissue. The most common place where we find adrenal blastoma originating from is the adrenal glands, but it can also arise in many other parts of the body, particularly in the posterior mediastinum and the paraspinous ganglion in uh, the low thorax, the abdomen, or the pelvis, or other locations. This is the most recent neuroblastoma staging study. Um, which is the International Neuroblastoma Risk Group from the International Risk Group. Um, L1 is imaging defined as basically being a relatively easy to resect localized um, neuroblastoma tumor. L2 is also localized disease, but with certain risk factors that make the tumor hard to resect. M stage disease, as you might expect, um, are patients who have metastatic disease and patients with MS stage disease have are young and have very limited extensive metastases only to the skin, the liver, or the bone marrow. This is a very complicated slide and I certainly don't expect the audience to memorize this. I certainly haven't. But this is how we do risk stratification that's critical for the radiation oncologist because it helps us determine which patients we'll be treating. Frankly, I rely on um, the medical oncologist to do the risk stratification, um, and then occasionally I will verify it. This is a really important slide uh, to review which is the overall treatment schema for patients with high-risk neuroblastoma. These are the patients on which I'll be focusing. It's a very complicated treatment algorithm, which begins with typically a biopsy, and I'm gonna come back later to talk about why it's important that the surgeons do a biopsy rather than a, a resection of the tumor. After the biopsy, the patient starts with induction chemotherapy, at the end of which, or near the end of which, the patient ends up having a resection of the primary site of disease. Um, assuming that the patient has had a good response to chemotherapy, they then proceed to myoblative chemotherapy, typically with two autologous stem cell transplants, and then the consolidative radiation therapy. This is followed by uh, immunotherapy uh, and um, retinoic acid therapy. With this complicated treatment algorithm, there has been substantial progress in terms of the overall outcomes for uh, these patients. If one looks back to the 1990s, only about a quarter of patients were surviving at five years from their diagnosis. On the most recent children's oncology group study that has been reported, AMBL 0532, or 0532, um, the overall survival of patients approached 65 to 70% at five years. As radiation oncologists, we really only treat high-risk neuroblastoma patients. Only rarely do we treat patients with low or intermediate risk disease. And so that's my focus. I should further add that the focus of, um, of this talk um, in terms of the radiation therapy is on the treatment algorithm that I just showed before, that patients who have recurrent disease or in other situations are treated somewhat differently, including different doses, and I'll try to highlight that as I continue with this presentation. The benefit for radiation therapy in terms of local control 
comes from a study in the 19 that was conducted in the 1990s and then reported in 2003 by Dr. Daphne Hoskogan, then at University of California, San Francisco, in which she looked at patients who were conditioned for their stem cell transplant with either uh, 10 gray of total body radiation or those patients who also got 20 gray, uh, got a total of 20 gray um, to the primary site disease, and the patients who received 20 gray to the initial sighted disease had improved local control, and that's where the 20 gray comes from um, for treating uh, patients uh, to improve their local control with radiation therapy. A critical term to think about in terms of um, the radiation therapy is that the gross tumor volume is the extended disease at the time of surgery, whenever surgery happens. So if a patient has a surgery at the time of diagnosis to resect all of the tumor, then that is the gross uh, tumor volume. But it's important to say that these patients typically have chemosensitive tumors, and so it's certainly in the patient's best interest to have only a biopsy up front, then have the induction chemotherapy that results in a much smaller tumor at the time of surgery. Um, so that the uh, radiation oncologist tumor volumes tar and target volumes are substantially smaller if the surgery is delayed until after induction chemotherapy. When we simulate these patients, we typically treat them under anesthesia because of their young age. We typically do 4D planning CTs uh, so that we can uh, determine the appropriate planting target volume expansions. Again, the gross tumor volume is the extent of a tumor at the time of surgery, including the involved lymph nodes. The clinical target volume um, is uh, the GTV plus 1 to 1 1.5 centimeters anatomically confined, which really in practice means carving it off of the kidneys and perhaps the liver um, and the vertebral bodies. Critical question is what should be the dose? Um, and ANBL 0532 examined whether patients um, who, uh, who had gross residual disease after surgery would benefit from having a boost. And then on subsequent analysis comparing ANBL 0532 to a preceding study in which patients did not have boosts in a setting of gross disease, there was a non-statistical improvement in local control um, or of the lesions that were treated or the cumulative incidence of local progression after radiation therapy in patients who received boosts was, uh, was not uh, substantially improved um, if they received a boost compared to historical controls. Now, again, I want to emphasize this is in the setting of patients who are following the algorithm that I showed above that involved induction chemotherapy, surgery, two autologous stem cell transplants, then radiation therapy. If a patient has recurrent disease um, or are, is in a different clinical situation, the radiation oncologist should consider going to a higher dose, perhaps 36 to 40 gray in, in conventional fractionation. So what is the disease at the time of surgery? And that might seem obvious, but I have to say in practice, it's not always obvious. So what we typically discuss these cases at Seattle Children's Tumor Board. Prior to the surgery, the surgeon almost always confirms that she or he is going to be placing surgical clips outlining the extended disease at the time of resection so it's clear because the radiation oncologist is going to come back months later to do the consolidative radiation. Um, I always pay particular attention to how far down the periodics um, the surgeon resects. I obviously look at the pathology report to determine of the resected lymph nodes, which ones were involved, and compare that to the op note. I talk to the surgeon, and I'll say that typically in perhaps a third or a half of cases, I review my uh, planning target, my, all my target volumes um, with the surgeon to confirm that I'm radiating the right extent of disease. In terms of contouring, I'm going to use a little bit of a strange analogy, but hopefully it's helpful uh, for communicating how I think about this disease. 
imagine that the neuroblastoma or an adrenal neuroblastoma is a grapefruit or a very large orange that is pushing down an apple where the apple represents the kidney. When the surgeon resects the tumor, she leaves effectively behind a rind of the grapefruit or the orange into which the apple now, now moves superiorly. That represents the, uh, uh, the gross tumor volume or GTV that we're aiming at onto which we add a CTV. It effectively surrounds much of the kidney and one can look at the preoperative imaging to look particularly carefully about exactly how far down around that kidney that has now moved cranially the target volume should extend. Um, Quark.org has a really nice contouring atlas, but I'm just going to say I think the contouring atlas that they show represents probably the easiest case I've ever seen, and it doesn't reflect the cases that I see. So I'm going to walk you through a case um, uh, that I've treated in the past couple of years. So the first thing I do is I fuse in our planning treatment software the extended disease, excuse me, the preoperative. Uh, CT scan, which may be after induction chemotherapy, to my planning CT. And then I contour out the extended disease on that preoperative CT scan. And I will say, in our institution, we primarily stage these patients and restage them with CT scans rather than MRIs, but that varies between institutions. Then I contour the GTV, which is in red here, and you can see I'm making anatomic corrections for the vertebral body, for the stomach in this case, um, and the kidney. Then I do an auto expansion of 1 to 1.5 centimeters in orange or in green, just as guidelines, and then I contour manually the clinical target volume of CTV, carving off the kidneys, carving off um, the spine and the lung, and I go up to about five millimeters deep into the liver unless the surgeon indicates that I should go deeper. Then I add a planning target volume, which I show in lime here, in which I typically go five millimeters in all directions, but seven millimeters superiorly. But again, my 4D CT guides my radiation planning. Finally, I add what I call the involved vertebral bodies as a separate structure. That is, in axial plane, uh, the slices of the vertebral body that um, are touching the PTV. Now, I will say the contouring guidelines say also include the transverse uh, processes uh, from the vertebral bodies. I haven't in yellow here, uh, but one might. But again, it is whatever, um, on axial slices, whatever vertebral bodies are touching your PTV. Here are some of the planning constraints. Um, AMBL0532 probably had the strictest planning constraints for organs at risk. Um, honestly, it's incredibly hard to meet that ipsilateral kidney constraint, at least I think it is, if we follow that, uh, that contouring paradigm that I described if, as thinking about a rind surrounding the ipsilateral kidney. My highest priority is the contralateral kidney, um, but also the liver because these patients after their autologous stem cell transplants certainly have an elevated risk of venoocclusive disease or sinusoidal obstructive syndrome. Um, I will say that these planning constraints are so strict that Emory University did an analysis of patients treated at their institution and found that using these constraints and even when these constraints were exceeded, um, hepatic and renal toxicity was very rare. I've also shown on the right the ANBL 1531 planning uh, criteria um, uh, and, um, and they are fairly strict, although in practice not quite as strict as the ANBL 0532 um, criteria. So I want to conclude by covering two controversial topics uh, uh, when treating patients with high-risk neuroblastoma in the upfront setting, um, which is first, 
does want to treat metastases. So as radiation oncologists, none of us are particularly surprised that if you treat metastases, you're probably going to add to local control. And here's a patient that I'm recently treating, that actually I'm currently treating. Um, this is her MIBG scan um, at the time, uh, not after autologous stem cell transplant. At that point, um, the findings were more subtle, um, but these were uh, MIVG findings at the time of diagnosis in which she had disease in the base of her skull um, as well as the bilateral orbits um, and she also had other sites of metastases. In terms of looking at recent studies, AMBL0532 uh, allowed for concurrent treatment of up to five sites that remain MIVG active prior to autologous stem cell transplant. COG0 excuse me, COG-AMBL 1531 allows for reassessment after the autologous stem cell transplant if there are more than five active sites. And that's not uncommon, that there are times when a patient still has seven or eight areas of MIBG activity um, going into autologous stem cell transplant, and one has to narrow down what are going to be your sites. And, and on this study, uh, which is not closed yet, um, it allows for you to repeat your MIBG study after autologous stem cell transplant. Typically, these patients are treated uh, to the same dose we used for the primary site. Um, and Casey et al. from Memorial Sloan Kettering, she's now at the University of North Carolina, uh, looked at their five-year local control of patients treated typically to 21 gray, and about 70% of the sites were controlled. What's really unclear is how much of a difference this makes in terms of event-free survival or overall survival. It's no surprise to us as radiation oncologists if you treat the site with a reasonable dose of radiation, you're gonna control that site. But for a patient who initially had widespread metastases um, and now has a more limited extent of disease, um, it's unclear whether this actually uh, makes a long-term difference uh, for the patients. So. I think practice in terms of treating metastases really varies by institution. At our institution, we look at MIBG activity both before and after autologous stem cell transplant, and if there, and um, we'll typically treat a couple of sites that remain MIBG active at those times. We of course factor in the late morbidity of treatment. If a patient has five or six or, or many more sites all around the skull, one has to think really carefully about where those are and what, and what the long-term morbidity would be for the patient um, if they were to survive but receive radiation therapy so extensively when these patients are typically quite young. But we also factor in what is gonna be the morbidity to the patient should they progress and uh, in a particular location. So for example, um, we might be a little more inclined to treat a metastasis in the orbit because should the patient subsequently recur and progress in that area, it can be quite morbid for the patient. The last topic I want to cover is whether you use proton radiation therapy for neuroblastoma. Again, I want to acknowledge um, my, uh, that my practice includes both protons and photons, and that may have some bias, that may introduce some bias in how I present this. Um, in theory, protons, which uh, don't have an exit dose or a marked reduction of exit dose, can be associated with less radiation to the bowel, to the liver. Um, but I'd say in practice, it's complicated. So this is a case in which we did treat a patient um, with proton radiation. And you can see that shortly after the target, the dose drops off and it redu reduces some dose um, to the anterior bowel. It also reduced some dose um, to the liver. Um, it's unclear whether that was going to make a long-term difference for the patient, but we had the option of delivering it this way and we felt that it probably made a difference for the patient, at least in reducing what may already be a low risk to, a lower, to an even lower risk and reducing the uh, tissue that's at risk of secondary malignancies. In practice, this is really complicated. Um, and um, the tricky part is that how you pick the beams with protons, because protons don't stop based on how far they've traveled, they stop based on the density tissue through which they passed. So the most robust beams 
are ones that come in posteriorly through the kidneys or through the liver. Now, we don't want to range through the liver for obvious reasons if we're worried about sinusoidal obstructive syndrome. So, in practice, for me at least, if the target really is in front of both kidneys or even in front of one, I typically use photons rather than protons because in my experience when I have done comparison planning, I found higher doses to the kidneys when treating with protons, or I should say planning with uh, protons, uh, than with photons. I add the caveat because when I've done comparison planning and the kidney doses are higher with protons, I treat the patient with photons. Um, so the patients that I think benefit from protons are ones in which the disease is really midline and in comparison planning, um, you're not gonna have a higher dose of radiation through the kidneys. If you're having your beams come in posterior through the kidneys, I think there's gonna be a higher dose to the kidneys and the kidneys are absolutely critical for the patient receiving their subsequent therapy and, uh, and in terms of having the latest long-term morbidity. What this really means is the vast majority of my patients I treat with photons in spite of the fact that I also have an option of treating them with protons. I really want to thank the organizing committee again for inviting me to participate. It has been a great pleasure um, and an honor to join all of you. Please don't hesitate to contact me in the future if there are any questions that I can answer for you. Thank you again.